Thank you very much. Um, despite of having been on Zoom for two years, we cannot, I cannot start the Zoom transmission, but it will go on. Uh, when I was when I realized that I have to speak here in front of you and give a talk, I was in deep trouble for a long time, because for those of you who know me, my kind of work is on very obscure, very small texts. I'm an empiricist. I'm a speculative empiricist, and I want to know very well the text before talking about them. And I was wondering what kind of talk would be interesting or at least you know not completely boring for this distinguished audience um, and then I'm, i put something together and i thought well history is not always and does not always have to address directly our present day concerns but it always gives us answers with philosophical significance so even when working on what looks like a very restricted very esoteric corpus of texts or historical artifacts, one can obliquely draw lessons of a very general nature. So let me begin with the end of my talk today, from the lessons I've learned in the past decade or more, in which I was investigated, investigating the Baconian inheritance of the early modern science. Left, you said, to move. Well, mine doesn't move to the left, does it? I am trying to go to the left. Okay. How does science reach the public? That has been a question that has been asked here a number of times, and it's one of the questions that we like to ask. There are two ways of answering. One looks at institutions, and historians of science did a lot to clarify which institutions contributed to the rise of public science. The other way to answer is to look for stories. To see which stories about science have captured the public imagination. From Gulliver's travels, to Jules Verne, to Frankenstein or A.G. Wells, to Orwell and Huxley. Often it was the great literature that helped science to reach the public. I would call these stories stories about science but there are other stories as well stories that are stories of science both because they are generated from within the sciences but also because they were in some ways foundational for the emergence of scientific institutions so let me begin with a very simple and very general statement which constitutes the main philosophical message of my talk, which will probably be too long anyway, so you will be left with the main philosophical message and no details. Institutions are built on stories. Money, people, and logistic can also help. But quite often, money, people, and logistic are not enough, and it's vital to have a good inspirational story. And often the story is more important than the plan, the people involved, or the funds available. It is about such a story that I would like to talk today. The story of Francis Bacon's New Atlantis. I claim that the New Atlantis is one of the foundational such foundational stories of science. I'm aware that in the short time I have here, I will not be able to substantiate this claim in full. I'm also aware that without a demonstration, my claim institutions are built on stories looks either trivial if you agree with it or preposterous if you don't. But let me try nevertheless to illustrate this claim with an example, with this example, and see whether in this way its philosophical consequences become more visible and more interesting. Now, as everyone knows, the New Atlantis was one of the most widely stories of the early modern world. It was read by Bacon's contemporaries who often saw in it a blueprint or a model of a would-be society of Illuminati, a European brotherhood of wisdom and light. It was read by Bacon's followers on both sides of the channel who often referred to their own scientific academies by using the name invented by Bacon for this society, namely the Solomon's House. 
Authors of esoteric treatises and mystic literature also liked it. They emulated and mimicked parts of Bacon's story when developing plans or dreams of secret societies. Like Thomas More's Utopia, the New Atlantis became the starting point of a genre. Now, 20th century literature has partly forgotten all this when it placed both books on the same shelf in the category of utopia. During the past decade or so, I attempt to disentangle this genre and identify its members, the Solomon's Houses of Early Modern Europe. And this is part of the works we did with my colleagues in Bucharest, translating some of these stories and editing the New Atlantis. And here is a list of such continuations or interpretations of the New Atlantis that contain interpretations of the Solomon's House. It's not an exhaustive list. It is merely representative for the kinds of writings that took Bacon's New Atlantis as a starting point in the 17th and 18th century. We can find on this list writings that claim to be continuations of Bacon's seemingly unfinished story and writings that aim to interpret and adapt the model of Solomon's house to a particular cultural context. Until very recently, here are some, an English one and a French one. Until very recently, the common features of these writings have escaped the attention of the historians. Or when noted, they were explained in terms of similarities of vocabulary, of imagery and rhetoric. In fact, in order to fully understand the common feature of such writings, one needs the right context, which can function as a key to the labyrinth. What did I do wrong? Hmm? Okay. Um, I have suggested in a number of papers that a good framework to understand the common denominators for these Solomon's houses is the genre of the early modern fable. Bacon readers and most of the authors of early modern Solomon's houses generally agree that New Atlantis is a fable. After all, this is what the introduction state. Well, now I cannot go on. Can I go on? What did you do to my slides? <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, this is what the introduction states, um, that the New Atlantis is a fable designed to exhibit a model description of a college instituted for interpreting nature and the producing of great and marvelous work. That's not surprisingly, 17th century readers call it my Lord Bacon's fable of New Atlantis and talk about the Solomon's house in terms of a poetical, romantic, maybe fictional or prophetical model of a sort of commonwealth. Therefore, it would be safe to suppose that most of the readings I showed you before read it in this genre, the genre of early modern fable. Now, what is a fable? Fabula, the Latin rendering of the Greek word mythos, was used rather indiscriminately through the Middle Ages and the Renaissance to refer to Greek mythology, the works of Roman poets, and some parts of philosophical texts, such as Plato's Republic and the Timaeus. To any text, in fact, which seemed to contain encoded hidden nuggets of wisdom disguised in disguised in vivid, striking, and seemingly incomprehensible language, as long as this language contained traditional classical references. In fact, as has been shown, this gave rise to a particular way of reading and relating to ancient texts as collections of fables. It's a reading very different than our more modern reading today. It's a reading that looks at a text as a collection of riddles one has to crack using the appropriate key. Teaching philosophy with the help of the fable has the advantage that addresses the imagination as well as the intellect. It veils as much as it explains, inciting curiosity. And in addition, it establishes an internal natural hierarchy of readers, much like the crossword puzzle is doing or like what Proclus said 
in his famous commentary on Plato's Republic. It appears to me, says Proclus, that whatever is tragical and unnatural in poetic fictions excites the hearers to the investigation of truth, attracts them to recondite knowledge, and does not suffer them to rest, satisfied with superficial conceptions, but compels them to penetrate into the fables, to explore the obscure intentions of the authors, and survey what natures and powers they intend to satisfy to posterity by such mystical symbols, but prevent the profane from busying themselves about things which is not lawful for them to touch. To facilitate this kind of reading, one needs first to be familiar with the code. And early moderns had their own reference books written by the so-called mythographers. Large dictionaries of symbols, names, emblems, and stories. This revived the ancient genre of mythography, but as has been shown, they also simplified it restricting allegorical interpretations and tending to transform the fables in exemplar, in exemplar fit for teaching. But exemplar of what? In a previous article, I suggested that there are three ways of interpreting the language of the fables in the, let's say, end of the 16th and the beginning of the 17th century. The hieroglyphic, the accommodationist, and the poetical. According to the first, fables are encoded philosophical messages written in a secret mythological disguise, as Conti puts it, that would only make them accessible to the selected few. According to the second accommodationist way of reading, the main message of the fable is pedagogical. The encoding becomes no more than a simple and attractive device for teaching philosophy, politics, but also astronomy or medicine. As Cesare Ripa put it in his extremely popular iconology, the images of gods are nothing else but veils and garments fabricated in order to recover that part of philosophy regarding the generation and corruption of natural things, the disposition of the heavens, the influence of the stars, the stability of the earth or other similar things. In this accommodationist interpretations, interpretation, philosophers use fables to talk about nature, translating the complex questions of science into a fam language familiar to any educated reader. Thus, they spoke of the multifaceted Proteus to designate the infinite mutability of nature, or about the monstrous Scylla to designate the dangers of speculation and speculative philosophy, or they talk about Prometheus to designate providence. Or, like Bacon, who also wrote his own mythography called The Sapientia Veterum, where he talks about Cupid and its properties to designate, think about, and remember the complex and the mysterious properties of the atom, of the Lucretian atom. A third kind of reading the fable is what I call the poetical interpretation. This works with the premise that the wisdom of the ancients was not, was not merely expressed by poets, such as Homer, but that its contents are only accessible to a form of poetical imagination. In the 17th century, this interpretative stance created many debates over the interplay between poetry or poesy and philosophy. Bacon claims, for example, that ancient poets preserved and transmitted nuggets of the initial revealed wisdom that were lost to the philosophers, to the ancient philosophers. And following Bacon, George Sands of its metamorphosis, English mythologized and represented in figures, 1632, begins by stating that fables are more ancient than any extant authors or perhaps than letters themselves and can produce a deeper impression upon the mind that can be made by the liveliest, liveliest precepts of philosophy. This is basically a gloss on Bacon's De Sapientia Vetter. The hieroglyphic accommodationist and poetical reading are not mutually exclusive, of course. In fact, we can find in Bacon all three of them, De Sapientia Veterum, 
offers an accommodationist interpretation of natural and political phenomena expressed in the language of fables. But what is encoded in this language is a particular Baconian natural philosophy this time, so not, not the philosophy of the ancients. By picking and choosing elements of mythography, Bacon creates powerful emblems. Proserpine, the entrapped goddess, stands for the spirits enclosed in tangible bodies and their struggle to break up. Ceres, the hidden goddess, represents the arts and sciences that Bacon believed are hidden in the depths of nature awaiting discovery. And Bacon claims that the hunt of Pan, which leads to the discovery of Ceres, is a depiction of his own method of discovery through experiments, or what he calls, in other words, the learned or literate experience. Now, the New Atlantis, to go back to where I started, makes ample use of the poetical reading. It claims to disclose fundamental truths that precede any philosophical system. It addresses the imagination, it clearly produces a deep impression on the minds, and it contain, contains several emblems, among which the Solomon's house is the most important. So to sum up this parenthesis, a fable is an encoded story that produce, is designed to produce a deep impression on our minds, containing striking images and classical references, and it's formulated in such a way that it incites curiosity because it seems to veil as much as it explains. It requires interpretation. And central to such stories are these emblems. Okay, so that's the emblem of Solomon's house. Assembled from elements pointing to a wide range of classical references, the emblem of Solomon's house depicts a society of knowers, a brotherhood of illumination and light with a strict hierarchy and specialized functions. Its end is said to be, I quote, knowledge of causes and secret motions of things and the, uh, and the enlarging of the bounds of the human empire to the affecting of all things possible. This foundation has an island at its, at its laboratory it has marvelous instruments and magical power. It glorifies inventions and the inventors. Bacon said that the island has long and fair galleries with patterns and samples, so museums, um, patterns and samples of inventions, and it has statues of inventors and so on. The Solomon's house has 36 members, 12 merchants of light, three depredators, three mystery men, three pioneers, three compilers, three benefactors, three lamps, three inoculators, and three interpreters of nature, plus numerous novices and apprentices. Now, this is the emblem. What does it mean? What it is supposed to encode? To the modern eye, to the modern eye, this is deceptively familiar, deceptively familiar. And it was interpreted like, you know, some, someone famously put it, half a monastic order, half an institute of research. But this reading does not respect the convention of the genre I was talking about. If the New Atlantis is a fable, as Bacon claims, and if the Solomon's house is an emblem, then we have tried to look behind appearances and crack the riddle. To find the hidden meaning encoded in this story, to find the problem Bacon hoped to solve with the help of it. Now, I think that put into modern terms, the problem is that of institutionalizing collaboration. In Bacon's terms, who didn't talk about institutions, Solomon's house encodes an answer to what I have called elsewhere, the problem of superstition. In Bacon's view, as you might know, the human intellect is distorted, diseased and beset by what he calls the idols of the mind. Our judgment is forever impended by biases and by false opinions. And putting people together does not help. It actually makes things worse. 
because as Bacon very well knew, crowds multiply emotions. Philosophical schools perpetuate biases and propagate the so-called idols of the theater. When people get together to observe nature or to perform experiments in common, it is very likely that by simply reaching consensus, they produce and perpetuate error. Or in Bacon's vivid language, superstition. Because as we know, philosophers and scientists strongly believe in their theories or in the fa favorite methods of their own schools. And yet we are told the fathers of Solomon's house mastered somehow the problem of superstition, which is the one of the main problems of Bacon's writings. Okay, I'm trying to shortcut here some things, but this is one of his main problems, how to produce something else than superstition. And he claims, well, here is Solomon's house. It has solved the problem. The fathers of Solomon's house have the capacity to, I quote, discern between divine miracles, works of nature, works of art, and impostures or illusions of all sorts. And this special power of discernment features heavily in the story of the New Atlantis beyond the description of Solomon's house. For example, again, cutting short, corner, short cornering things, but for example, we are told that this island of Ben Salem was converted to Christianity by a miracle, and it was only the father of the Solomon's house who had the power and the capacity to recognize and attest the miracle, receiving in exchange the books of the scripture. We are also told that it is precisely because of this power to discern between true miracles and superstitions and the works of nature that the fathers of Solomon's house received the mission to investigate the works of creation in the first place. And it is also because of this special power that they can pursue what Bacon calls the trade of light. But how did they acquire this capacity? This is, I think, the question that Bacon tried to solve in all his writings. And the answer to this is encoded in the fable of New Atlantis. No wonder that Bacon's followers liked his story so much. They worked with the same corrective epistemology and recognized both the problem of knowledge that becomes superstition and the problem of collective wisdom that becomes sectarianism. Echoing Bacon, Thomas Pratt emphasized the capacity of the Royal Society's virtuosi to distinguish sharply between natural phenomena true and false miracles, and suggest that common witnessing and hands-on experimental work keeps each other's idols at bay. It's a simple, uh, so that the consensus is not an emotional state anymore, but the famous matter of fact. Now, this is a very simplified reading of Bacon's story, and one that incidentally doesn't work because as Pratt knew too well and emphasized in his book, Quoting Bacon, it is one of the great secrets of nature that men's passions are more capable of being raised to higher degrees in company than in solitude. This is true, Pratt continues, in assemblies, the wits of most men are, are sharper, the apprehensions readier, their thoughts fuller than in their own closets. Spread's hope was, however, that on a society of virtuosi, a mingling of tempers, as he puts it, would balance the biases as long as everyone sticks to observation and experiments and avoids speculation. But it is a thin solution, one that leaves much to be desired. Now we can read Joseph Glanville's continuations of the New Atlantis as an attempt to sort out some parts of this problem of biases in scientific collaboration. Because what Glanville does in his continuation of Solomon's house is to kind of make the Solomon's house the end of a long process of learning, which begins with an academy and is doubled with uh, learning about theology, learning logic, learning all sorts of things. So education, the common education for Glanville is responsible for the formation of that discerning capacity that we are looking for. And there are other forms of, and okay, he throws into the bunch just to be sure that, that education is not 
uh, brainwashing, he throws into the bunch probabilism and skepticism. But still, somehow one feels that the solution is not complete. There are the forms of simplified readings as well. The esoteric Solomon's house is on my list, place the burden on divine illumination. It is because they are Illuminati that the members of the Solomon's house do not produce superstition. And for the same reason, they can collaborate without biases and emotional interference. Meanwhile, among the Solomon's houses of the early modern Europe, there are also some which clearly recognize the depth and difficulty of Bacon's problem and attempted to solve it by instituting rules and regulations for scientific collaboration. Some, for example, recognize in Bacon's structure the idea of specialization and expert knowledge because Bacon's groups of three are doing very particular things. Some only read books and search experiments in written artifacts, which means that they have certain skills. Uh, some collect experiments from other sources like patents, collections, the trade of secrets. Compilers merely systematize such collections and hand it to the group who are actually involved in testing and inventing. Each group only performs a limited number of tasks for which presumably they have acquired expertise. Incidentally, they do not look at all like sages or Illuminati, not even like philosophers. The structure suggests specialized skills and what we call today distributed knowledge. No one has all the knowledge. Knowledge is in the group somehow. I have tried to show elsewhere that what Bacon ends with, it's something more likely, more, more like a thinking machine. But however this may be, many of Bacon's followers recognize the specialization requirements encoded in the complex structure of the emblem of Solomon's house. And all the continuations of New Atlantis are tinkering with the structure, even those who pretend are merely translations. They are changing the structure, the number, the, they have they put in there their own ideas about how this structure leads to some sort of collective wisdom. Most of them multiply the institutions, imagining colleges of experiments and medicine, colleges of theology, colleges of inventors, or in the case of Bacon's disciple, disciple Thomas Bouchel, a college of minors. 18th century Baconians also recognized the philosophical nature of the problem encapsulated in the fable of the New Atlantis. In Raguet's continuation of New Atlantis, 1702, the society of Solomon's house has several stages of development. It begins as a small society of naturalists which achieve first a limited task, a natural history of the island, and then pursue similar research in the rest of the world. Raguet raises the question of costs and funding for the society and aims to show that the trade of secret is a self-sustained enterprise. But more interesting, he supplements the problem of collaboration with the problem of competition by inventing, by adding to the society, a system of learned learning based on problem solving. Raguet's Solomon's house is also extremely large, it comprises the whole island, it has laboratories and manufacturers in many places, so it's a whole society. And then even later, an extremely interesting continuation of the New Atlantis that I discovered recently, which I don't have on my slides, apologies. Um, Robinet, volume six of the Dictionnaire Universel, he calls Solomon's house La Famille, in recognition of its natural character, much in the same way in which for Aristotle, the family is the natural model for any commonwealth. In this continuation of the New Atlantis, Solomon's house stands for a society, for a large society of knowers, um, which however is a model for the whole world. Robinet claims that Bacon, Bacon's plan was to build in England a society that would gather in itself all the advantages of all the diverse academies of Europe. 
And Raguet also comments on the previous French translation of the New Atlantis, inserting his interpretation in a tradition. In all this, we see a Solomon's house very much adapted to newer and newer contexts. But we also see a recognition of the power and allure of Bacon's story seen as a driving force for institutionalization. I, would, I can give many such examples, but I would only add one more. Returning to England this time in 1733, Peter Shaw edits and abridges Bacon's works. He's extremely knowledgeable of Bacon and he makes the New Atlantis the companion to Bacon's grand scale plan for renovating all the arts and sciences. Shaw claims that Bacon's story is only seemingly fictional. In fact, it encodes purely philosophical things. Let me just read this out. Whilst our mind labor under a kind of despondency and dejection with regard to the operative philosophy and refuse to put forth their strength, the, wing, the wings of hope are clipped. And in this situation, so in the situation in which we are, in which our wings of hope are clipped, in this situation, the mind seems scarce accessible, but by fiction. That's a way of saying, if they are at loss, tell them stories. Whence the prudent and seasonable use of invention and imagery is a great secret for winning over the affections to philosophy. We have here in miniature, here in the New Atlantis, a summary of universal knowledge and so on. So it should be a part of the Augmentis Kentiaro. The dignity and utility of the design may appear from hence that not only Mr. Cowley endeavored to imitate it, but even the Royal Society of London and the Royal Academy of Paris have from their first institution employed themselves in its execution. In Peter's show interpretation, we find a clear recognition of the fact that Bacon's story was a driving force in the rise of public science, that its seemingly fictional character was an encoding of philosophical problems. The same philosophical problems that we can find in Bacon's treatises handled this time with the instruments of the fable. Shaw versions of New Atlantis is an annotated translation with a running commentary which aims to offer us a cipher to the labyrinth. At every step of the story, he establishes cross-references with the problems that Bacon attempted to solve in his Novum Organum or in the Augmentis Cientiarum or in the Natural Histories. The list of achievements and discoveries of the Solomon's House, for example, is prefaced with the following editorial note. Every article here is so pregnant with grand philosophical views and directions for further discoveries yeah, that a, a large comment were requisite to unfold and draw them out of popular views. As they lie here closed wedged in the aphoristical or axiomatical manner, they will probably affect only the philosophers. It seems a just observation that the generality of readers, like the generality of game, are only to be caught by the nets widespread, by the Asiatic rather than the laconic style. And on this account, concise hints and intimations are always more acceptable to the intelligent, as larger discourses and full explanations are to the less knowing. With this, we are back to the interpretation of the fables. In several footnotes, Shaw indicates that this or that particular content will only be accessible to the reader that has a tolerable, quote, a tolerable knowledge of the scheme and tendency of the authors of the author, author, author's new organ. Shaw seems to prefer a hieroglyphic interpretation of Bacon's fable. He sees in the New Atlantis a text that is carefully selecting its readers, but he acknowledges also its poetical functions the story of science does work, and it did work to aggregate minds and institutions. However, unlike the French Baconians I discussed before, Shaw is less optimistic regarding the extent to which the Royal Society or the French Academy of Sciences have managed to solve Bacon's problems. Time and again, he indicates that much more is needed. An exasperate footnote, footnote indicates, for example, 
that, I quote, this is a noble intimation, the discovery that Bacon alludes to, but what society is a set part for making experiments of this kind? Or what has all Europe done if for these hundred years towards executing the entire scheme of Solomon's College, 1733? Okay, let me conclude. My exercise in this talk was to show that we, what we can gain if we place the new Atlantis in what I think is the correct genre, the genre of the fable. I have shown that Bacon's followers recognize the elements of this genre, and while writing edited translations or continuations of the story, they also interpreted it, deciphering the emblem according to their new context. This process of translation, interpretation, and adaptation was governed by the recognition of the philosophical problems Bacon attempted to solve in the first place. And chief among these problems, what Bacon called the problem of superstition, is what we call today the problem of collaboration. After all, collective wisdom reminds a desideratum and scientific societies are still plagued by biases and can become sectarian. Meanwhile, what the case of the New Atlantis tells us is that the story of the emergence of public science is not a story about science. It is a story of science, foundational for its emergence and evolution. In it, institutions are established gradually and in a piecemeal fashion from a complex process of encoding and interpretation. And I hope I have shown in this talk that it is the role of the historian to retrieve, understand, and explain all the fascinating, fascinating and intricate details of this process. Thank you.